بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ایم نائلا گل لیکچر ایٹ ڈپارٹمنٹ آف زولوجی کسٹ اٹس دا تھرٹینتھ لیکچر آف دا سبجیکٹ اینیمل فزیولوجی ود دا کورس کوڈ زیڈ ڈبل او ڈبل فور ون آر ٹاپک از ڈائجسٹیو سسٹم ڈی گلوٹیشن ٹو ڈیفیکیشن وی ول ڈسکس دی پروسیس آف ڈی گلوٹیشن وی ول اسٹڈی the role of pharynx and esophagus. We'll also discuss anatomy and physiology of stomach, small intestine and large intestine. At the end, we'll study the process of defecation. Deglutition The word deglutition is a derivative of a Latin word deglutir. That means to swallow down. Thus, The act of swallowing food is called deglutition. The process of deglutition is controlled by brain. But we know that the brain can be divided into different parts. So, the deglutition centers are actually located in medulla oblongata and pons of the brain. This process involves three phases. The buccal phase the pharyngeal phase and the esophageal phase. The first phase is the buccal phase. This phase is voluntary inaction. When food is ingested, it is mechanically broken down by mastication and chemically by salivary enzyme. When the bolus is ready for swallowing, it is squeezed posteriorly into the pharynx by the upward and backward movement of the tongue. The second phase is the pharyngeal phase. This phase occurs involuntarily when food enters the pharynx. This is the time when impulses are sent to the deglutition center in the brain. The brain signals the soft palate and uvula to close off internal layers to prevent reflux of food into the nasal cavity and at the same time impulses are sent to the epiglottis to seal off the larynx to prevent the entry of food into the respiratory tract. The buccal and pharyngeal phases can be observed here. Tongue squeezes the food backward, uvula closes off the nasal passage while the epiglottis seals the respiratory tract. The third phase is the esophageal phase. This phase is also involuntary in action. During this phase, the upper esophageal sphincter opens to allow food to pass through the esophagus by a peristalsis. When food reaches the lower end of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter opens to allow food to enter the stomach. Let's recapitulate deglutition. Deglutition refers to the swallowing of food. Deglutition can be divided into three phases. The buccal phase, which is voluntary in action. During this phase, tongue moves upward and backward against the palate. The pharyngeal phase, which is involuntary in action. During this phase, soft palate and uvula close off internal layers and epiglottis seals the larynx. The esophageal phase, which is also involuntary in action. During this phase, the upper esophageal sphincter opens to allow food to pass by peristalsis. When food reaches the lower end of the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter opens to allow the food to enter the stomach. Pharynx Pharynx is a muscular tube that connects to the larynx and esophagus. It is a common passageway for both digestive and respiratory tract. It is almost 12 to 15 cm in length. Though it is a common passageway for both digestive and respiratory tract, food doesn't enter the respiratory tract 
because at the time of swallowing, epiglottis temporarily seals off the trachea so that the food doesn't enter the trachea, rather it follows its own path, that is, it enters into the esophagus. Esophagus Esophagus is a muscular tube which is 25 cm in length. When swallowing begins, smooth muscles in esophagus contract and propel the bolus to the stomach. Neither pharynx nor esophagus contribute to digestion. At the upper end, esophagus has the upper esophageal sphincter. Sphincter actually refers to a bundle of muscles that normally maintains constriction but relaxes when required. We have already studied that this sphincter allows the food to enter the esophagus. At the lower end, esophagus has the lower esophageal sphincter, which is also called the cardiac sphincter. At this sphincter, esophagus meets the stomach. When lower esophageal sphincter is closed, it prevents acid and stomach contents from traveling backward from the stomach. At this junction, numerous mucus glands are present to secrete mucus to protect against gastric juice reflex. Stomach Stomach is a muscular hollow organ which is distensible. It means it has the ability to stretch and expand. It is an enlarged segment of digestive tract which is located in the left superior part of the abdomen. It performs three main functions. It stores and mixes bolus received from the esophagus. It secretes substances like enzymes, mucus and hydrochloric acid. It controls the rate at which food moves into the small intestine. Stomach is divided into five regions. The cardiac region. It is the first part of the stomach below esophagus. The fundus. It is the superior part below diaphragm. The body. It is the largest and main part of the stomach where food is mixed with gastric juices and starts to break down. The antrum, which is also called the pyloric antrum. It is the lower part of the stomach that holds broken down food until it is ready to be released into the small intestine. The pyloric region. It connects to the small intestine. The medial and lateral borders of the stomach are curved, forming greater curvature on the left side and lesser curvature on the right side. The food enters the stomach by cardiac sphincter at the cardiac region and leaves the stomach to enter the intestine by pyloric sphincter at the pyloric region. The mucosal and submucosal layers of the stomach are thrown into large folds. These folds are called the gastric folds or gastric rugi. These folds allow the stomach to expand upon the entry of bolus. Folds disappear as the stomach is filled. We have already studied in the earlier segment that the entire gastrointestinal tract is composed of outer serosa, two muscular layers, that is, the longitudinal and circular muscles, the submucosa and the innermost mucosa. But stomach has three muscular layers instead of two. Stomach has the outermost longitudinal muscles, the circular muscles and the innermost oblique muscles which add in digestion by grinding the food together with digestive juices. Stomach mucosa 
has two types of tubular glands. The gastric glands, which are also called the fundic glands or the ozentic glands, and the pyloric glands. Gastric glands are composed of three types of cells mucus neck cells, ozentic cells, also known as the parietal cells, and the peptic cells, also known as the chase cells. Mucus neck cells secrete mucus, ozentic cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12 in the ileum. Peptic cells secrete pepsinogen. The pepsinogen secreted by the peptic cells is activated by the hydrochloric acid secreted by the parietal cells. Pyloric glands are composed of mucus neck cells, G cells and D cells. Pyloric glands are similar in structure to ozentic glands but they have no parietal cells and they have few peptic cells. Instead, they have numerous number of mucus neck cells. Mucus neck cells are identical in structure with the mucus neck cells of ozentic glands and they mostly secrete mucus. G cells secrete a hormone called gastrin that stimulates acid secretion. D cells secrete a hormone called somatostatin that inhibits acidic secretion. When bolus enters the stomach, it distends the stomach wall. Distension as well as act of eating causes the gastric pits to secrete hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Hydrochloric acid activates pepsinogen into an active enzyme called pepsin. Pepsin, mucus and hydrochloric acid mix with the food and begin to break down protein. At the same time, smooth muscles also start contraction and vigorously churn and mix the food. About 3 to 4 hours after meal, stomach contents have been sufficiently mixed, forming a semi liquid mass called chyme. The word chyme is derived from a Greek word chymos, that means juice. The chyme is released into small intestine by pyloric sphincter. Small intestine is the main site of digestion. It's 4 cm in diameter and 7 to 8 m in length. Small intestine is divided into three parts. The first part is duodenum, the second jejunum and the third one ileum. Duodenum is involved in digestion of food while jejunum and ileum both are involved in nutrient absorption. This diagram represents a single villus, monosaccharides, amino acids and minerals are transported through the walls of villi into the capillaries by diffusion and active transport. Water is drawn into the blood by osmosis. Glycerol and fatty acid enter the epithelial cells of villi by diffusion. In the epithelial cells of villi, fatty acid recombine with glycerol to form triglycerides. These triglycerides then get coated with proteins to form smaller droplets called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons from the epithelial cell enter the lacteal, which are the central lymph vessels. From these lacteal, chylomicrons 
move into the lymphatic system and eventually join the bloodstream for transport throughout the body. Thus, we have studied that monosaccharides, amino acids and minerals are carried by the blood while glycerol and fatty acid reunite in the epithelial cell to form triglyceride. Triglyceride gets coated with proteins to form chylomicrons and these chylomicrons are carried by the lymphatic system. Large intestine Large intestine is also known as the colon. It's approximately 5 feet long. Large intestine has no circular folds, villi or microvilli. Therefore, its surface area is much smaller as compared to the small intestine. By the time food residue reaches large intestine, most nutrients and up to 90% of water has already been absorbed by the small intestine. Large intestine has three primary functions. It absorbs water and electrolytes. Water enters by osmosis into the bloodstream and lymphatic system while minerals are actively transported or may diffuse into the bloodstream. Large intestine produces as well as absorbs vitamins. Many bacteria and fungi exist symbiotically in large intestine. They feed on food residue in the large intestine and in turn secrete amino acids and vitamin K which are absorbed by the large intestine. It forms and propels feces, undigested plant fiber, intestinal cells that are shed and other waste products are moved towards the rectum for elimination. Let's discuss the different segments of large intestine. Cecum. It's the first section of large intestine. It looks like a pouch and is about 2 inches long. It takes in digested liquid from ileum and passes it to the ascending colon. Cecum has an extension called appendix. Appendix contains abundance of lymphoid tissue and may function as part of immune system. Ascending colon. Ascending colon absorbs remaining water and other nutrients from indigestible material. Transverse colon. It is the longest part of large intestine, having two curvatures. The curvature on the right is called the hepatic flexure because it is next to the liver. The curvature on the left is called the splenic flexure because it is close to the spleen. Descending colon. Descending colon stores fecal material. Sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon contracts to increase pressure inside large intestine causing stool that is fecal material to move into the rectum. Rectum holds feces to be eliminated by defecation by the anus. Poor motility causes greater absorption due to which heart feces are formed in transverse colon and causes constipation. Excess motility causes less absorption and results in loose feces called diarrhea. Defecation The elimination of fecal material from the body is called defecation. The muscles in the colon contract and move the stool towards the rectum. This is known as mass movement. Rectum 
is a distensible muscular tube. It has the ability to expand. When enough fecal material moves to the rectum, the rectal wall stretches or distends. The rectal walls have special stretch receptors. When they are stretched, they send signals to the brain. After the defecation reflex is triggered, a person can either delay or defecate. These are the references. Thank you so much.